Well, okay then. I'm Kelly Beatty from the International Dark Sky Association, and I want to welcome you all to our global close of what has been a 24-hour extravaganza. This is our second global conference. You know, the I in the IDA stands for is for international, and we have taken that to heart. We've had uh, speakers from 16 different countries. Uh, and at last count, we had more than 2,300 people registered. Maybe someone could chime in without how many people actually attended. This has been the largest gathering of dark sky advocates ever. And so I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, from our very first uh, speaker, Aparna Ven uh, Venkatesan, to the ones we're about to hear from, uh, Colonel Ron Guerin and Dr. John Grunsfeld, astronauts for NASA. It has been just a star-studded array of speakers from all, of, all over the world, of course. And, you know, I think one of the things that I have taken away from this conference is the fact that everyone has an inspiring story and has been inspiring all the rest of us and rejuvenated us to, to fight the good fight. You know, light pollution is one of those win-win, uh, fighting light pollution is one of those win-win propositions where we all benefit, society benefits, our, uh, our, our world benefits from conquering this, this problem. And so I, have, uh, I am grateful to all of you who have come tonight and uh, today or morning, whatever happens to be your time zone. And I'm just humbled that uh, so many people care about this very important topic. I'd like to turn it over, if I may, to uh, Ruskin Hartley, who is the executive, uh, the CEO and executive director of the IDA. Ruskin, take it away, please. Thanks so much for getting us going, Kelly. And what an incredible 24 hours it's been. And I, I wanted to start off by just saying a huge thank you to all my colleagues who have made this happen. I don't know if we can bring them up, but I just wanted to start off by saying we've, IDA has a small but mighty staff who does incredible work to support all of you out there in the field doing this work. I just want to say a huge thank you to Susan, to Betty Meyer, to Anna Marie, to Pete, to Lauren, to Ashley, to Paris and to Lauren Hoadley up in Utah. Thank you so much for making this happen. Uh, it has been a very great honor to work with all of you and roll with all, this, with all the punches and the stuff. And so far we're on time. So thanks everyone. It's been just a remarkable fun ride. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and also to say just thank you to the people who made this possible. I think we had 27 speakers when we reached out to them. They, they said, yes, how can we help? How can we be part of this, even if it means I have to get up in the middle of the night and do this to be part of that? So thank you, all of you, for sharing all of your stories, all of your rich stories, and building this incredible libra library, an inspiring library of stories from around the world, um, from all of you on the, on the front lines working through this. Um, and thank you to our board of directors, many of whom have been participating over the last 24 hours as well. Hopefully you've had a chance to meet with some of them. They're, they're the volunteer leaders of this. They're the people who put the time in to help guide and steer and provide the, the governments and oversight for this work. And they're really, as Diane said at the start, they're there to ensure that the careful stewardship of the organization is meeting the needs of the dark sky and the dark sky movement. I did just want to spend a few minutes reflecting on some of the themes that really resonated with me. And I, I wanted to acknowledge at the start that um, while I participated in many of the sessions, we had these incredible breakout sessions and I look forward to going back and reviewing and hearing some of those other pieces. I wanted to go back to where we started and, and, and really with Aparna. And uh, Aparna really said something to me that has then resonated as we've been through some of these conversations. And, and two things jumped out at me. She talked about the duty to consult. And she also talked about the vision of moving from um, conflict to uh, a call to co-create a sustainable future, be that in space, or I'd argue here on the ground, based upon collaboration, not conquest. And I think what I have heard in the last 24 hours through many of the stories is that work is happening now through the dark sky movement. I, I was just struck by some of the stories about the dark sky places that you have helped create, that you have helped certify through this, the, the young, young firefly plaque in Asia, inspired by the work in Arakai Mackenzie in New Zealand, um, the work that Nobuaki is leading in Japan, 
around Bisley Town, where he is now literally co-creating a new class of clients with the industry so that we can take what's happening in those parks and spread it out to the rest of the landscape. Through Remy Boucher talking about Mount Magantac, the way that that incredible dark sky reserve up in Canada, the first and one of the largest dark skies in the world, has continued to innovate. And it is kind of spreading its message out throughout the other provinces in Canada, sitting down with people, helping them to understand this. Um, to what the work that Alejandro has been doing, sitting down with the Indigenous communities and understanding their stories and how he can help solve some of the problems that they're facing. Um, even to the work, the workshop with Art Hushan, not even with the work with Art Hushan in terms of looking at community um, protection through environmental design, which is really about going and sitting down and listening to communities and creating a future for them so that you can create those wonderful sustainable places. The other theme was really that the power of personal experience, the importance of both getting an experience in dark night sky, but also going and experience the difference between good and bad light. No, I, help um, um, facilitate Landon's discussion about the night walk. If you weren't part of that, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to what it takes upon an incredible dark night walk in a city. So you can start to introduce those concepts to people. And I think it's really showed the importance of meeting people where they are, asking what, what are your problems? How can I help solve your problems? It's not about solving our problems here. And the other theme that rang out loud and clear to me was just the critical role of communication and the really power that art and culture can play in this. You now, many of us come from a science background. It's easy to throw up graphs and talk about numbers, but bringing those artistic and cultural perspectives into it and really looking for how, how can we make it fun and relevant to people. And there is such incredible work going on out there. There's so much that we can learn from all of that. I wanted to end then by coming back to something that Diane Knudsen shared in, in her opening remarks. And as you remember, you no, know, she's expect, expecting her second child, her family looking forward to welcoming their second child uh, in January. And she said, what if we're the last generation to see the stars? I was just not half an hour ago in, in, a, in a breakout room, an award ceremony uh, with uh, Tim Hunter the co-founder of IDA. And he said something I think is equally provocative and I think also powerfully inspiring and I'm kind of paraphrasing what he said, but what if we were the generation who got it right from a technical perspective here on earth? We know how to do this. We know the solutions to light pollution. So what if we're the, the generation that gets it right? And as we look ahead, every child, could see from the see from the from the park in their town the Milky Way overhead. So I think it's really that inspiring type of vision that can drive us forward together. And again, I want, just wanted to close by thanking all the participants across so many time zones who have got up in the middle of the night or early in the morning and figured out how to juggle everything else going on in their life to come and participate this and enrich these discussions. I hope it's left you inspired and wanted to go back and kind of put, your, put our collective shoulder back to the wheel and work together to continue to unveil the night. So thank you for everything you're doing on behalf of the Dark Sky Movement and all of the creatures and the people who don't have a voice in this. It's really making a difference. And with that, I want to turn it back to Kelly to introduce our closing session, which I am super excited to listen to, into. Thank you, Kelly. You're on mute though. So if you, if, if you, if you hit <laughs> So you, thank you very you much, Justin. Voice and and, uh, <laughs> and I, I really want to appreciate those, those uh, I hope that everyone appreciates those thoughts and the, the guidance that you have shown in directing this enterprise for the last few years, but we're going to pivot now and I want to introduce uh, an old friend, a longtime colleague, Mike Simmons. Uh, Mike has been active in amateur astronomy for more than half a century. In the Los Angeles area, uh, he, if you can imagine, it's sort of an oxymoron amateur astronomy in the LA area, but he was past president of the LA uh, Astronomical Association, uh, founded the Mount Wilson Observatory Association. In fact, the thing that characterizes Mike is he is an organizer par excellence. And uh, he, he is probably best known to all of you as the founder and longtime director of Astronomers Without Borders. And so he's going to be uh, 
engaging in two very special people, uh, Colonel Ron Guerin and Dr. John Grunsfeld. Mike, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Kelly, very much. We have known each other for quite a long time and it, it's been a pleasure. And if you can believe it, uh, Los Angeles used to be kind of dark when I was a kid. So <clears throat> it's a good example of what can happen if you're not careful. So uh, hopefully we can get some of that back. Uh, this is where I live right now. Here, Jeff Dai gave a workshop earlier in Mandarin and China took this picture for me. So today I have the distinct privilege of being able to present two uh, retired astronauts uh, who have done all kinds of things before and after that. Uh, Ron Guerin is a former military uh, jet combat pilot, and NASA astronaut. He spent 178 days on the US space shuttle, the Russian Soyuz, and the International Space Station. He's done four spacewalks. <clears throat> Before that, Ron spent his time under the sea, living and conducting research on the bottom of the ocean in Aquarius, world's only undersea research lab. Uh, since uh, returning to the, the dry land and surface of the earth, he's now known for his humanitarian work to improve living conditions on earth. And he's also the old, only astronaut I know of who has ordered pizza from low earth <laughs> orbit. Uh, Ron has uh, a number of books he's written. Is, uh, his, including the orbital, orbital perspective, lessons in seeing the big picture from a journey of 71 million miles, terrific book that I've read, Floating in Darkness is his latest, a new one for kids, Railroad to the Moon. And uh, there we get to see uh, Floating in Darkness, which is uh, a life journey that par excellence. Uh, John Grunsfeld is, is a well-known name to most of the people in this audience. He's an astronaut and scientist with an extensive experience as a leader in space and science missions and national space policy. He's served as a NASA astronaut, associate, associated, okay, I can't read, associate administrator for science and chief scientist at NASA, pretty important. And before that, he, he was the uh, deputy director of Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, managing the science program for the Hubble Space Telescope and the forthcoming James Webb Space Telescope that everybody is waiting to see launch now. Uh, he's an astrophysicist uh, with an interest. Uh, his research focuses on planetary science, exoplanets, search for life, uh, beyond Earth, with a special interest in developing uh, future instrumentation. Um, he Now, he's the only known uh, astronaut to have called into a radio talk show for repair advice about uh, fixing his spacecraft while he was in it. Uh, the space shuttle, when he called into car talk, everybody loves that. And he's an experienced space repairman in his own right, having had, I believe it's three trips, uh, house calls to the Hubble Space Telescope. So he's been in charge of the science for it. And when things go wrong, he goes out there and he fixes it himself. So it's a pleasure to have both of you. Thanks so much for taking the time to be a part of this. Uh, it, it, it fits with many of the things you're doing in many ways, but you're very busy people. So thank you very much for being here with us. So. Thank you, Mike. Uh, John, John is appearing uh, from Kennedy Space Center, yeah, but he's thrown up one of his snapshots from one of his trips there, the Hubble Space Telescope itself, and hopefully we can talk about that a little bit as well. Now, light pollution, less familiar to Ron, maybe more so to John as an astronomer, um, but it's part of the larger picture of environmental uh, preservation. It's an important part of everything that we're doing. And the important part here, and I actually have adopted Ron's uh, motto of the key is we. Collaboration is the way we fix these things. And that's been Ron's big <coughs> uh, mission really to get people to work together. And I think that comes through in the books he does and especially in the talks he gives and so on. So wh what I wanted to hear from you guys is what you have learned from 
being in space, about working together for the better, betterment of Earth. When you it, get the overview effect, we can talk about that and see what is happening there. What's your perspective on the lessons, the takeaways from that, that the rest of us can apply down here on Earth? Uh, Ron, you want to take a shot at that All first? Right. Yeah, I was going to suggest that. <laughs> that, that <laughs> not that I take a shot first, but that you direct your question because we're because John and I are both going to defer <laughs> to each other. Yeah, so, I, um, <clears throat> yeah, I think I think the International Space Station program, in particular, when we talk about space exploration, is a, is an incredible example for the world to follow. Uh, and if you boil it down to its yeah. most simple simple terms, you know, we work as an internet a seamless international. Uh, crew on board the Inter International Space Station to maintain and protect the life support systems of the ISS. And we need to follow that example and work together as a single, uh, integrated, seamless international crew uh, here on, on the surface of Spaceship Earth to um, maintain and protect the life support systems of Spaceship Earth. And I think um, one of the big things that enables us to do that on the space station is we have an overarching goal. The number one goal is to protect the, the life of the crew and to and uh, just below that is to protect the mission uh, and to make sure that we can um, effectively and accurately conduct the mission on board the space station. And so because we have that overarching um, goal that we're all marching towards, then you know we can make sacrifices when needed uh, of our own particular wants and needs and desires, and not just us as individuals, but the various nations that uh, have joined together in the International Space Station Partnership uh, for, the, for, for the overarching goal. And we have a, uh, it seems like a lot harder uh, challenge doing that uh, on the surface of the earth. And I'll, I'll just kick it over to John. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that's exactly right. You know, the other side of it though, is we get the absolute privilege to be able to look down on planet earth. And you know, I'll never forget uh, one of my crewmates, Mike Massimino, on his first flight. Uh, it was a Hubble flight, but we we got to orbit, and he got out of his spacesuit and floated up to the flight deck where the windows are, and he looks out and he goes, "Wow, the Earth is a planet." <laughs> and you know, we so often lose sight of the fact that you know, one, not anybody on this call, but most people go to sleep at night; they don't worry about the night sky. They look out, uh, I happen to be in Florida now uh, at the Saturn V building for an event and you look out over the Atlantic and you know it does look like we're on a flat earth, but it's not, you know, we live on a real planet. And when you're in orbit, looking down as you orbit the earth uh, and in low earth orbit once about every, you know, 95 minutes or so, you know, you see the continents, you see the oceans uh, and what really surprised me the most the first time I got to space was not that the earth looked pristine and, you know, that you can't see a lot of evidence of people. It's that everywhere I looked, you could see evidence of people. And while you do see international borders, you see lights that are different colors in one country than another. You see, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, differences in prosperity, agriculture and such. But nevertheless, you can't ignore the fact when you're orbiting the earth once every 92 to 95 minutes, that everything we do on earth, every people's uh, light pollution or air pollution or what we do in the ocean, that it's all connected. You know, there's no escaping and Ron said it, you know, we are on spaceship earth, you know, and whatever some one person does on spaceship earth or one, you know, country really does affect everyone. And so it, it's only collective action that we're gonna solve problems, whether it be a dark sky or a uh, or warm planet. So uh, doing something good in one area potentially makes something worse in another area nearby. Just they well, you can't do them separately. Yep, it's a systems engineering problem. Uh, yeah. you know, we need to understand the earth as a system. Uh, we need to measure what's going on on the earth as a system. Uh, and then try and figure out what the right solution is so we don't make things worse. You know, you, we should never underestimate humans' abilities to make things worse. I, I agree with that. So I, I want to talk a little bit or hear a little bit from you about that sense of Earth as a planet, because everybody on Earth, except for a few people that still haven't gotten the memo, know we're on a round planet. <clears throat> and 
traveling through space together on this, just like the other planets. But it's not, it's not really inside of us that way. We really don't get it. We don't have a feeling of that. And we, but when you see uh, Earth from space, I, I've been looking at pictures from space since the first ones were taken. But I know from talking to people who've been there, it's not the same thing that you see the stars around it. I, I'm used to looking at planets through big telescopes, but I've never seen the earth that way. What's that experience like? How is it really so different than just looking at a big picture? Uh, John, why don't you take that? Well, the, you know, the first thing is, and it's one of the reasons why we send humans to space is that, you know, having, looking at a picture, uh, even if we eventually get, you know, high resolution holographic pictures, uh, is just not the same as, as being a human being observing your home planet. Uh, you know, and, and Ron and I can talk about this through a spacesuit visor, you know, a piece, piece of single piece of plastic. Um, you know, you can't get more minimal than that and still survive. Uh, and it, it's the fact that we are, you know, as, as much as I like to claim that I'm a Vulcan, uh, I do have human emotions and we all have human emotions. And so it affects us in ways that go beyond cognition. Uh, and I think people feel that uh, looking, you know, looking at pictures as well, beautiful pictures. Um, but our eyes are incredibly high resolution and we see details and, and we're able to, to feel things and see the motion. Um, you know, Ron spent much more time in space observing the earth than I have. Uh, so I'll hand it over to him. But I think it really does make a difference to have, you know, to have that personal feeling uh, of being able to see the richness and beauty of the earth. Yeah, but John spent a lot more time in a spacesuit out in space. So, <laughs> but I, I agree with everything that, that John said. But uh, what I would add to that is it's seeing the planet from space is not just a visual experience. It's a, it's a full body experience. And one of, the, one of the really key things about it is that you're detached from the planet. You're in a weightless environment. You're floating weightlessly, you know, uh, effortlessly there. And, and you're looking at this indescribable, beautiful planet, you know, turn, turning si silently and slowly below you. And the way I like to, to describe it is, is imagine that you're experiencing a beautiful scene on earth. You're, you're sitting on a beach, you know, looking at the sunset. Maybe you're out looking at the stars, you know, on a on a, a dark, clear night. Um, maybe you're sitting at the the edge of the Grand Canyon, you know, looking out over over that. And all of those examples, gravity is pushing you down into that scene. You're you're within the frame of the masterpiece, right? You're you're not outside of it, looking in. And so, when you're in space, you know, you become a detached observer you know the separation from the, from the physical world and between you and the physical world is is this void you know this vacuum um i think that really enables a, a, a much higher sense of gratitude a much higher sense of awe and wonder um because the other aspect of it is you see how fragile it is too i mean it looks like a little gust of wind can blow the whole atmosphere away and it's sobering it's it's really sobering to think that this teeny tiny little paper thin layer protects and keeps every living thing on the planet alive and there's absolutely positively no doubt in your mind when you see the planet from that vantage point that we as humans can put enough crap up into the atmosphere to to change things um and to and to make things uh, really bad and so i think there's there's you know that that aspect of being detached uh, becoming a silent witness of of what you're seeing as opposed to being in amongst it i think is is another important aspect of the experience so let me ask you this I, i've always seen you know uh, we were introduced by frank white who wrote the overview oh. effect and coined the term so i have a lot of intellectual knowledge about that no direct experience yet <clears throat> i'll volunteer if either one of you uh, has a way to get me up there but uh it seems to me that that it's not like going higher in an airplane or higher in a balloon and experience Earth down there. It's really more like what we talk about other planets that you are, you see Earth out there. It isn't a place you're connected with it. It's just part more part of the solar system than it is a part of what you're a part of. Does that does that fit? 
Yeah, I, if you don't mind, John, I'll just because there's a really a, a story that re relates to what Mike just said is the first time I looked out the window of a, of a spaceship, I did feel like I was just flying in an, in an airplane at high altitude. We had, I was on Space Shuttle Discovery up on the flight deck um, when, I, when I had time to unstrap and, and get out of my seat. You know, we look, I was looking through the overhead windows and, we, and they were pointed straight down at the ground. And, and to be honest, I was a little disappointed. I was like, wow, I just feel like I'm in a jet at really high altitude. And then Karen Nyberg and I floated over to the, to, to the panel that opens up the payload bay doors. And as the payload bay doors opened and, you know, Earthshine streamed in and we saw the horizon come into view, that's where there, there was like this cognitive shift of that is a planet. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're looking at your, it's not just like flying in an, a high altitude in, in an airplane that you're actually looking at a planet hanging in the blackness of space. And there is, there is a, a you know, at least for me, there was like a, this, I, I kind of felt all the gears come into place of, oh crap, I get it now, you know, type of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. You try to fit it into you, your existing exactly. model. I exactly. That's a fine. really good point. The con because context is, a I, I think we as humans uh, attempt to process everything that we experience, any new experience in the context of our past experiences. And that's yeah. why when, the first time I went out on a spacewalk, I felt like I was watching a movie. I, it didn't feel real to me. Um, and it didn't feel real because I had no previous context to compare it to. Um, on my fourth spacewalk, it was, you know, I had lots of context to compare it to and, and time to process between between them and it, it definitely felt real so john john you have uh, any stories or comments to add to Ron, ron's experience there well the other you know the other side is that you know we do fly through the earth's shadow and and relevant to today's discussion uh, i was absolutely amazed at the amount of uh, electricity we spend to light our world at night that we beam out into space. Uh, and, you know, on one of my flights, I thought, you know, if an alien spacecraft could cross the great distance between the stars and was coming into our solar system, you know, they would have a telescope or on their flight deck, they'd have a view screen uh, and they would say, you know, hey, magnify that second planet. And they'd look at Venus, you know, and it would look like a little crescent. And they go, oh, that's interesting. They'd, you know, they might have already looked at, at Saturn and said, oh, another planet with rings, how boring. We have four in our solar system. And, and then they'd get to Earth and you know, they'd see a crescent and they'd say, oh, wow, these guys are really stupid. You know, we know there's life there, but look at all the energy they're beaming to space. You know, there must be no intelligent life on that planet. And they'd probably come and visit and you know, uh, you know, they might have a good time. But it really, you know, all kidding aside, uh, it really is stark how much you see of the earth at, on the night side uh, just because of all the lights. Um, and, and there's lots of interesting things you can see, but it basically looks like a Rand McNally map, you know, for the U.S., um, you know, just to see the incredible amount of light. Yeah, and that's the point I always make people to think that light pollution, who cares if you can't see the stars? They don't know because they've never seen the stars. <clears throat> but why spend money to send light up to up into space? So thank you for the segue into that uh, subject, John. And I wanted to ask you guys too about what what is the first look at the night side of Earth like? How is that different than what you expect? Is it much brighter than you think? Do you find light and dark uh, like what we think because we know there isn't as much light in some areas? Well, how how is it different? Because I haven't heard too many people talk about that aspect, like what you were saying, John. Well, let, let me start off, Ron, if that's all right. Yep. Um, you know, the first thing is, you know, when you want to go, well, I want to say one thing at the outset that, you know, I have many remembrances of being, you know, 10 or 11, 12 years old, laying on the grass, looking up at the stars uh, just outside of Chicago and, you know, wondering if anybody's out there. And, you know, being able to see quite, you know, a number of interesting uh, objects with, with a little tiny telescope that my grandmother gave me, uh, very inspiring. Um, if you go back there now, uh, the light pollution is so bad, you can see very little. Um, but that, so that was inspiring uh, to, to me. And so I, I do believe 
in the power of, of people being able to see the stars. So I was very interested in uh, going to space and prepared, uh, intellectually anyway, uh, to do some stargazing. Now, you know, I mentioned that we orbit the Earth once every hour and a half. And so when you want to go look at the night sky, what do you do? You go outside and you spend about 30 minutes dark adapting. You know, if you really want to have good uh, sensitivity. And that's about half of our shadow side of the Earth. So you don't have much time. Uh, and, and so I would actually go down to the mid deck and put on eye shades in advance when I really wanted to do any stargazing uh, while we were on the light side of the Earth so I could come up. Uh, and I would hold star parties. We'd turn down all the lights. You know, we'd close the little access panel to the, the mid deck so we could get it really dark, close the computer screens, and we were able to do some star parties. And when you're uh, above the atmosphere or above almost all the atmosphere, you know, the first thing you notice is the stars don't twinkle. You know, it may seem obvious uh, that they shouldn't twinkle because they twinkle because of the upper atmosphere. Um, so that as a result, the star images are much, much uh, sharper. What I didn't expect is that because the images are much sharper on your retina, the, in the image plane, they cover you know, a smaller number of rods and cones. Mm -hmm. And so the surface brightness is higher. And that allowed me to see the colors of stars much more vividly um, because I could uh, recruit the cones uh, in, in my retina to be able to see the stars. And I saw you know, just you know, much bluer stars and oranges and yellows and whites. And you know, it was as an astronomer, you know, knowing the Hirschman Russell diagram, you know, I was actually be able able to see that. Now, wow. you know, on a tall mountaintop, you know, you can get pretty close, um, mm -hmm. you know, but, you know, at, at some of our observatories and such, but I'd never experienced that kind of color. Uh, then we had uh, the, the crew up and I was doing a quick star party and we were flying over the Southern Hemisphere. And I pointed out the Southern Cross and the uh, Colsac Nebula, which is this nebula of gas and dust that blocks the stars behind it. So it's coal black. And then I pointed out the large Magellanic cloud and described that it's kind of a satellite galaxy and uh, filled with globular clusters and, and these ancient collections of stars. Uh, and then I complained about a smudge on the window because people bump into the window with their heads and their greasy hair you know, makes a smudge. And I grabbed one of the microfiber cloths and tried cleaning the window. And no matter how hard I wiped it, it didn't go away. And then with a, a fair amount of embarrassment, I said, oh, there's the small Magellanic cloud. I'd never seen it before, naked eye. Uh, and it was by going above the atmosphere, we were able to see it. Uh, so it really is kind of a neat thing to do, but you have to be fast um, because otherwise you come back around the earth and the sun comes up. Sunsets and sunrises are, are really amazing, um, but I'll hand it over to Ron. Well, wow, John, this is, and people are loving this because I've never heard anything about that. And in the, up until recently, I'd never heard anybody talk about it, looking the other direction away from the earth at the stars, but I've never heard it to this, uh, to this extent. Ron, you don't come from an astronomy background. What was the experience like for you and your impression of the earth from down there and, and looking the other way? Yeah, the, the, the fighter pilot interpretation was, oh, cool, look, the stars have color. So <laughs> I didn't have all that, I didn't have all that analysis. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but, you know, I, when I was living on the bottom of the ocean, we had some um, uh, really knowledgeable people about the marine life down there. And uh, uh, that story, John, made me wish I had an opportunity to fly with you because that would have that been nice to have that, uh, that, those sessions. But um, I, if I can, I'll, I'll cover both. I'll, I'll look down and I'll look up, or I'll look towards the earth and I'll, I'll, I'll look away from the earth. Uh, as John said, we, you know, have 16 sunrises and, you know, we go around the earth 16 times a day. So every, you know, 45 minutes, don't quote me on that, but, you know, around an average of, of that. Um, um, and that's not even tr true either, but um, we're going to have a sunrise or a sunset, right? And as you approach um, the, the line below you uh, that we call the Terminator, you know, the line that separates day from night, which is just an extraordinary thing to see that line below you. Um, thunderstorms just cast these long shadows across the horizon 
the, the, the you watch the clouds turn to pink into red into gray and finally black and then as we cross into the nighttime shadow of the earth um i i found myself you know gasping as uh, as all the lights of the cities and towns you know all the evidence of human activity all of, all of a sudden comes to life and and as john said it you know there's no you know, we say that, that we say that we can't see borders from space. That's actually not true. We can see borders from space, especially at night. Um, you know, you could clearly see the border between North and South Korea. Uh, you can clearly see the border between India and Pakistan, which is illuminated. Um, and you know, at night, a lot of those things um, show up, and they show up as like scars on the otherwise beautiful landscape, uh, as artificial. In, in the case of you know the the line between North and South Korea, or, or in uh, India and Pakistan, their man-made barriers to collaboration clearly visible from space, where people on either side of that line can't co cooperate and collaborate on their shared problems, even though they live in the exact same area. And so, um, you know, there's like John said, there there would be no um, no doubt that there was life uh, on on our planet, and there might be a debate on the level of intelligent life uh, that exists there. So just uh, real quick, I'll talk about uh, looking away. And on my third spacewalk of my first mission, uh, I, I my feet were clamped to the end of the space station's robotic arm, and it was flown through this maneuver that we call the windshield wiper. So it took me across a big arc across the top of the space station and back, and I was holding this you know 500 pound pump module in my hands as as it was doing that. And I didn't really have anything to do at that time but hold on to this thing and go and go for a ride and. Uh, the first swipe of the windshield wiper was taking me up in, uh, in on the, we were on the on dark side of the of the of the orbit. The second swipe was on the daytime. And as we were going up away from the uh, lights of the space station, you know, just up in, up into this like, inky black darkness, it was kind of eerie. Um, and for whatever reason, I decided I was going to turn the lights off on my helmet. <laughs> so I took one hand off. This, this box and I, I turned the lights off of my helmet and initially that was a really really bad idea <laughs> because <laughs> because all of a sudden I'm just in this like crushing darkness I mean I can't see anything I can't even see my hands in front of my it was just really really dark um but it was almost as if somebody was like was turning a dimmer switch you know as my eyes start to adjust I didn't have the 30 minutes um but I probably had 15, you know 10 15 minutes and when my eyes adjusted the first thing is I started to see my hands and they were, they looked blue. Like the light from the Milky Way was illuminating my hands blue. And then, you know, I was able to see the whole Milky Way come into view. I was looking at satellites going by and I went from looking at just crushing darkness to infinity. Um, and it was just absolutely breathtaking uh, and, and an incredible experience. And, you know, people talk about, you know, I felt really, really small. I never, I never had that experience of, of feeling really small. All, my only experience is just, being immersed in awe and wonder, just just going, wow, this is amazing. This is this is indescribable. There's no words mm -hmm. to describe this beauty. Um, you know, the, the stars aren't twinkling, so they look different. You know, there's there's things that that unless you think about them, you don't really realize. You know, when we look at the sun, we're looking at the sun against a dark sky, not a blue sky. So you know, and I was. It took me like it sounds simple. But it took me a couple of days to figure out why the sun looks so different. And like, oh, it's because it's a black sky, not a blue sky, and it's you know really the light is really white. You know, it's not, it doesn't have it didn't travel through the atmosphere and and have those frequencies. You know, it's not reflecting those frequencies. So there's, um, I just you know I think those are the two stories that uh, um, illustrate those those two different views. That that this is great because John knew what to do and what to look for. But a lot of times it's more interesting to hear from the clueless ones. Has See what no the clueless idea. ones have to say. Because I've had the opportunity to show people things through telescopes over the last 50 years or so, and sometimes through huge telescopes. And and they don't they literally don't know how to look, mm. really. And John, by the way, <clears throat> the same thing is true with the big telescopes, and you probably look through them, but if you haven't, let me know when you're in LA. <laughs> Go up to Mount Wilson and, and use a hundred inch. But you do get that. The, the bigger ones concentrate the light better when the scene's good and you see color, it's amazing. So, but uh, not like that. So, uh, I mean, this is fantastic. And uh, it seems to me all of this, all of the oddness will give you a, a sense of how 
unique the earth is. It's just where we are. It's what we're used to. It's what we're all used to growing up in a certain place and you leave home and everything seems odd. But then the next time you go there, it, it's, it's not odd anymore. But uh, earth is just such a different environment um, that the, you've talked about also the, the thinness of the atmosphere. Um, I've been told, I, I've heard stories about that, <clears throat> but uh, that it's like the peel of an onion. But somebody I know figured it out and said, no, it's thinner than that. I mean, there's always comments like that. And Ron, you mentioned, there's no question we can fill it up with gas, but it looks unlimited to us. So how, how can we get the idea across that we're, you know, how vulnerable it really is, how fragile it is? Do either of you have any suggestions on what we can learn from your experiences there? Well, I'm not sure. Uh decision makers you know, really are, are gonna to listen to us describing how thin and fragile the atmosphere is. I mean, you know, the, the picture behind me is from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, but it's reminiscent you know, of, of that Apollo picture uh, of the earth that you know, is credited for starting or at least helping the environmental movement uh, of the 1970s. So we knew that, you know, and just to kind of be clear, when we look at the atmosphere from low Earth orbit, we're looking at about 100 kilometers of the Earth's atmosphere, you know, that, that is bright enough and, you know, say in a sunrise, you know, we get to see the whole atmosphere and it's about 100 kilometers thick and we can only live in about 5% of that, you know, and, and the top end of that are people who are climbing Mount Everest, you know, and you can only survive there for a short time. So the real thickness of the Earth's atmosphere that we can live in is just a fraction of that tiny sliver that we see when we're in orbit. Um, and, and so I don't know, Ron has thought a lot more deeply about this, but I think if we're going to get collective action, it's going to be as a result of the experiences that people are feeling here on planet Earth uh, as a result of us despoiling our, our spaceship. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, we're on the on the eve of a new era of space travel um, and, and you know we're, we're going to see a lot more people fly in space and i think the more people that have the opportunity uh to see the planet from that vantage point and the, and, and it's it's and have a multiplying effect too because we're not going to just send scientists and, and test pilots we're you know we're going to send poets and artists and, and everything else and and uh they'll be able to share it much better um with everybody i think that's going to be a, a an important thing because you know, I, I was selected as an astronaut in the year 2000. I didn't fly till 2008. So I sat through eight years of listening to people, crew after crew after crew come back and say, you're not gonna believe how thin the atmosphere is. And so I remember, you know, having pretty high expectations for the thinness of the atmosphere, that I was gonna go out and it's, it was gonna be so thin and I was gonna be amazed by it. I had, there was nothing that could prepare me for seeing that with my own eyes to see and again, I, 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 it was sobering. It was scary um, to think that, that that's keeping us all alive. And so um, the pictures don't do it justice. Um, I, I don't know why they don't, but they, they don't. And uh, the more people that can share the emotion of that, to share the emotion of, of um, that really scary view of the planet that, that <laughs> and, the, and the conviction that there's no doubt that we could we could screw things up. Well, one, one of the people that had something to say about this, I think really well, and got a chance to say it immediately after getting out of his capsule was James Tiberius Kirk, otherwise yeah. known to some people <laughs> as William Shatner. And I thought that was a great yeah. I did moment too. because he talked about you go up and whoosh, you're through the atmosphere. He, he talked about it like, like it was a sheet just going through it like getting out of bed and above you is and he said is that death mm. uh, that was quite an experience <laughs> in, in a, such a quick uh, you guys have any comments on on what his few minutes of space flight uh did he get it right is, is you know is more of this going to be a good thing for everybody to see uh, i ron said it you know we're, we are going to see a lot more people flying in space 
you know, when I was growing up and, and dreaming of becoming an astronaut, I didn't really take it as a serious challenge because I assumed that by the time I was an adult, you know, everybody would be going to space. After all, uh, William Shatner was, you know, on once a week on Star Trek uh, and they were out exploring the galaxy. Um, so I think one of the keys and, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos and Blue Origin is a good example. Uh, you know, he, you know, other than being a billionaire is a leader of, of business and commerce and Amazon has a huge climate footprint. And so if people uh, who are decision makers, who are leaders of countries, who are, you know, U.S. senators, you know, we have Bill Nelson, who is now the administrator of NASA, a former U.S. senator who has been to space. You know, when we have people who, whose decisions make a difference for decades or hundreds or thousands of years going to space, I think it will be very powerful. Okay, well, that's, you know, and you just answered one of the questions from Walter uh, Rice, it looks like, I hope I got that right, who is asking about your insights into this recent, and they call it space race. I, I, I think that's a misnomer. It's not a race. There are more people doing it and uh, uh, about how important it might be. Um, and flipping that around, he also wonders about, is that going to get more people to see Betty Maya here has uh, informed us that $7 billion a year are sent, uh, uh, spent to send light into space. And that isn't just the cost. They're burning fossil fuels for the most part to do that. And that stays in the atmosphere. So what about from our perspective, looking back down, are people going to look at this and maybe get the idea that, that flooding your yard with light or lighting up used cars all night is, is just not worth it. Is that part of what you notice? Uh, no, uh, frankly, no. I don't think anybody's gonna have that unless they're educated um, because mm -hmm. uh, what they're gonna be enamored with is the beauty of it because even the lights look beautiful from space and, they're, uh, and unless they're uh, informed uh, they're not going to take that next step and say, and, and, and realize the, um, I mean, they might realize that uh, they might equate that with electricity and, and they might understand that, that, you know, that's primarily coal that's being burned mm -hmm. and putting into the atmosphere. Um, that's creating those lights. But, uh, I think we have a problem with, with the story. I think, I think we need a better story, uh, to tell people why it's important. No, Ron, Ron, is exact, Ron is right on point with two things. Uh, I, you know, it's the story and education. You know, so many kids these days, young people, don't know what's in the night sky because they can't see it. You know, and we're becoming increasingly urban. Uh, you know, for me as a 12 year old, you know, I think the night sky, the wonder and awe of the night sky is one of the things that drove me to, to study math and science and and want to become an astrophysicist, certainly, um, but also an astronaut, uh, and that still drives me. And education about, you know, the fact that, you know, we do use coal to generate electricity to light lights, you know, over half of which goes up into the night sky that prevents us from understanding the story of the stars. Uh, and this is something that ties back to Aparna and her discussions about uh, indigenous cultures who, put value on the night sky. And I think too many in modern society don't put any value in the night sky, unless you're an astronomer, in which case it's everything. But, uh, you know, we're missing out on the education side of, you know, taking students to a local observatory, planetarium, star party, uh, out to the country to see the night sky, to understand, you know, that it has, you know, value as human beings, uh, you know, and, and it's an education problem that then can, you know, foray into the discussions about, you know, what creates the light, you know, it's electricity, you know, light comes in different colors, we can change the colors, we can put reflectors uh, that increases our ability to see the night sky and, oh, by the way, reduces our energy footprint, reduces the amount of fossil fuel we need to burn for energy, and so on and so forth, uh, that will improve you know, not only the view of the night sky, but our life here on planet Earth. So education and story, I think, are critical. And uh, that's something I, I often emphasize, too. 
it is it's not just indigenous people that were here before all of us we have four star ratings or five star movies or whatever uh, astronomy is infused into our culture but it becomes abstract with with people who are disconnected unlike our grandparents we're the, the first generations to ever be disconnected from the sky yep. and it, it it is a big loss it's a half of our environment and you know <clears throat> uh, diana asked about just this very thing about communicating this to others what are some of the ways we could influence current astronauts to inspire their followers to care about protecting starry nights from earth sadly we often see tweets from them praising bright city lights when i've worked at observatories in the los angeles area there are people go up to like griffith observatory to look at the city lights i pause there for the coming out of the telescope to look at it because it's incredibly beautiful but there's something more than that. But what about the astronauts, other astronauts who are struck by what's happening to, we don't hear from all of them with the messages like you guys have. What can we do to, 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 to I, I feel like it's an obligation to tell you the truth. That they should say, well, say uh, more. You know, I know Ron feels this way. I do feel an obligation to share my stories um, but it, as we maybe discussed, you know, there's now 601 people who have, you know, left planet Earth for space, uh, for Earth orbit. Uh, that's not very many people. Uh, so it's very hard to have that multiplicative effect. You know, Ron's, you know, written uh, a couple of, of children's books and, and two books. You know, that's a good start. I don't know. How do you think we can amplify and, and multiply our, uh, our stories, Ron? I, th I mean, I agree with Mike, your statement that that we're not doing enough and and I'll I'll just speak for myself. I have not done enough um, over the years. Um, you know, I have pointed out, you know, when when posting pictures of, of the night sky, uh, you know, over the Earth, I'm sorry, of, of a Earth scene from from the, on the dark side of the orbit, um, the implications for for global warming and for um, pollution and everything else, uh, and the percentage of electricity generation that comes from fossil fuel based things. And I think that's important, but I don't think I've ever that I remember said anything about the night sky, about what it's doing to the night sky. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to do better at that, but I think the, the, I think the more people that do that, the more people will start to understand it. And, you know, I think a lot of people will say, well, we have global warming, we have deforestation, we have ocean acidification, we were in the sixth extinction, extinction event. You know, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of really pressing problems to think about. Why should we care about the night sky? You know, why is that so important? And it's so important because all of these things that I mentioned, as horrible as they are, are just symptoms of the underlying root problem. You know, below the, the waterline of the iceberg, you know, all those things are just the tip of the iceberg. What, what the real problem is, is we don't think of ourselves as planetary. We think of ourselves as global and we don't live on a globe, right? Global is artificial. It's, it's you know, it's our computer networks, our, fi our financial networks. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, every day I wake up in my bed, but I also wake up on a planet and we have, and we have to have that, we have to have that mindset in, in, in view. And as, uh, as we think of ourselves as planetary, it's really important that we maintain our night sky as well because 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 maintaining our night sky will help all those other things the more you know without a night sky without a clear bright bright you know night sky it's it's hard for us to to keep into our constant awareness the fact that we do live on a planet that we are planetary that we have one biosphere it's all interconnected it's all interdependent um and it's all we have and uh we have to protect it and so my answer that um, I hadn't thought of until about 30 seconds ago is the reason why that I one of the one of the reasons why the night sky is so important beyond the, the field of astronomy is that it reminds us of, of what we're doing for to all the other problems, you know, of, you know, it, 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 it could be a catalyst to help us with all the other problems, which I, as I said, were, are, are really just symptoms, symptoms of that underlying problem. And if and if we can through a clear, bright night sky, all ingrained in our DNA, the fact that we live on a planet uh, and that 
we're, we're all earthlings and and we're all you know traveling through the universe together on this spaceship we call earth and that there are no passengers on spaceship earth there's there, there's only crewmates and as crewmates we have a responsibility to mind the ship and take care of our fellow crewmates uh to me that's the answer um and and so how do we tell that story you know how do we tell that story in a way that people are going to get um and that's uh that's i i think things like this venue this forum that you're, you're holding right now are really important and and are really going to help mm. um help bring, that, so bring that about I, i'm going to opine just a little bit because i think this is really important and i and to expand on what you're doing first of all as far as the astronauts doing not doing enough to inform people present company is absolutely accepted run you do so much don't don't worry about that the night sky the fact that you can't see it at all is kind of a canary in coal mine you know if you were used to living in the country and you go to a city you say there's something wrong here i don't know what it is but this civilization is not doing things right because it always reminds me of Joni mitchell's song um cut down the trees, put them in a tree museum and charge people just a dollar and a half just to see them. Uh, people don't realize what they're missing. But one of, there are very few ways I think that you can um, uh, show people the impact we have. Take somebody out to a dark sky and say, here, look, this place is not the same. What's the difference? And light pollution is the one thing that if we solve the problem, it goes away. There's no residual. It's done. It's over. You can turn off the lights in a city. I've been to a town in Iran where they do that for star parties, turn the electricity off, and it, it's a different thing. So I say this because the people who are here, the activists here, the people who are watching and care about this, uh, are doing the good work of doing that, of showing people what it is they're missing. And that is one way to recognize our impact on Earth. And you guys have had the chance to see it more directly up in space, which is why we wanted to hear from. You. But um, these activists here who are joining us and who are watching you are really, really important. They are doing the same kind of work, I think. Mike, I think you brought up a really good point. Like if, if you go to the, you know, to your observatory and you look out over the LA basin and you see smog settled on there, it's mm -hmm. pretty obvious. You know, look, look what we're doing right now. If, if you turn that around at night and you look up and you're not seeing the stars, like you said, people don't know what they're missing. They, they're right. not, it's not as obvious. Yeah. And there's discussion in the chat too that I'm seeing whizzing by that I'm trying to pay attention to about planetariums. Well, planetariums, you can do things you can't do out under the night sky, although we have lasers and we point things out and so on. But, you know, it's a little bit like have, making models of trees to show people what forests are like. Uh, that's not the only purpose, but that's the only place that a lot of uh, kids are ever going to see the real night sky. I wonder if the, if some planetariums do do this, where that you could be under the the night sky in a planetarium, and they have like they could go, this is what the night this is what the night sky looks like now. This is what it looked like in 1920. This is, I mean, do, do, are the planetariums yeah. doing that? Yes, yeah, they do. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And I've seen that done at Griffith Observatory, and they show the night sky, and people recognize it, and then they turn it down. Yeah. And there's just this audible gasp from the yeah. audience. And it's not even realistic looking, really. I mean, it's not real. Thing. So, <clears throat> um, I, you know what? I'm not getting a cue on whether or not there's time here. I need to wrap up or what? How are we doing? Kelly or Betty, Maya, just let me know here. Um, hey, Mike, I, th I think we can uh, let it go for about 10 more minutes. This has been fabulous. So I don't want to like curtail it and choke it off. Uh, maybe if you can poke your head in the Q and A and maybe take a question or two from there would be great. I, I I've seen a few. It's it's I'm I'm not good at reading and listening at the same time. I'm not one of those guys that put an earpiece in uh, and listen at the same time. Uh, Friedel just put in something longer than I can possibly read. Um, but yeah, it's this. I'd like this to keep going uh, once it's not live anymore. If these guys will stick around, we can all grab a beer and keep talking. Um, so that was, let me go back to these. Um, you know what? There's a good question here. This comes up a lot, a lot. When <clears throat> you take a trip across the country in an airplane, you know, there's exhaust coming out. You can sort of see it, but when you see a spacecraft take off, 
there's a whole lot of stuff coming out of it. Now, so people don't realize sometimes, like I used to see the uh, shuttle engines being tested in the main engine, what came out was water. It's not hurting anything. But that's not the case with all the engines. So if we're taking people up into space to get this view for the purpose of informing them, getting them to realize that we need to take care of the planet, is that contradictory? John. Uh, th there is, you know, there's a little contradiction. Um, and, you know, the space shuttle main engines were a hydrogen oxygen combustion resulting in water vapor. Uh, the solid rocket motors, on the other hand, were burning an aluminum perchlorate uh, that was pretty nasty. And at a flight rate of four or a maximum of eight space shuttles a year, uh, the effect was relatively small. Um, and at least this is my rationalization compared to the good that we were doing uh, with, you know, bringing earth science experiments up to space, you know, the overview, you know, of astronauts, you know, coming back and talking about it. Um, you know, in fact, the injection of some of the compounds up into the upper atmosphere temporarily creates an ozone hole over the launch site, you know, closes very quickly. Um, and I've thought a lot about what does that mean if we're launching rockets every single day? Mm -hmm. Well, the new rockets are, are primarily uh, moving towards a liquid oxygen methane system. And so they are burning uh, oxygen and, uh, you know, methane, which is a carbon compound to create carbon dioxide. Um, and I don't know if I've seen a calculation, I have not done it, of if you were launching, you know, say, you know, a Falcon 9 class rocket every single day, how much additional carbon dioxide that would put in the atmosphere. Um, but, you know, when you think about all the transportation on Earth, uh, you think about, you know, all the methane, which is a very potent uh, greenhouse gas put out by uh, agriculture, you know, specifically cows and sheep. Um, you know, we live on a planet, it's a very big planet with a lot of people. Uh, it's hard to imagine uh, that space flight, you know, rockets are producing, you know, even a measurable effect, but it all adds up. And so I think that's something we'll, we will definitely need to think about. Now on the, on the good side, you know, the, the space shuttle uh, is still the most reusable system that we've ever launched. And the push for expendable rockets to go from expendable to reusable reduces their energy footprint substantially, even though it's driven by the need to make profits. Companies are in existence to make profits and that's driven the reusability. That also brings down their carbon footprint because they're not using all that energy to you know, start with bauxite and create aluminum and build rockets. Um, so, so I think if you were to look at the aggregate effect of, of modern space flight, meaning today, it almost certainly has a lower energy footprint, uh, even though we're launching more. Yeah. And I've heard, uh, I've been told that <clears throat> one of these suborbital um, rockets will produce about as much pollution as a cross country, uh, that is uh, across uh, North America, uh, flight full of people. Now there are fewer people on it, um, but, there, there are a few things. One is the price is going to change the amount of fuel. Maybe they'll have bigger ones. And the other is what will be the uh, impact of having people, more people in space and coming back and saying, no, you guys have got it wrong. Not just a few people who were engineers and fighter pilots and specially chosen people, but ordinary people like William Shatner, who I think has had a big impact. And <clears throat> This brings us back uh, also to another sort of full circle here. Tara talks about, uh, and I know the group, uh, group that meditates in VR uh, with a simulation of the overview effect. And she's, she's asking about uh, the overview effect in particular. I know, Ron, that that's something you've uh, experienced. I think that most, but not all astronauts do. Um, the kind of a general question we talk about where well, we can get people up there, 
we need to get them to see it as a planet. I, is the overview effect the answer? There's a lot of work I know because I'm involved in that and doing VR and things like this. I don't think it's going to be the same, but I haven't had the chance to sample it for real. Is the overview effect the, the answer, getting people up there, having them experience it? If I could jump in, the, the, the overview effect is an answer. It's not the answer. Mm -hmm. um, and just to be clear, um, you know, the, the first book I wrote was, was called The Orbital Perspective. And the main tenet of The Orbital Perspective is you don't have to be in orbit to have the orbital perspective. So I included in the book many stories of people who I, I um, felt exhibited the orbital perspective without having gone there. And, and so maybe just to take a couple minutes to, to explain orbital perspective versus the overview effect. Okay. I wrote the forward for the fourth edition of uh, Frank White's book, The Overview Effect. Uh, and in that forward, I talked about the relationship between the overview effect and the orbital perspective. And so if the overview effect is that, is that shift, is the light bulb that comes on over somebody's head as they see the planet from space, uh, and they see our unity and the beauty and the interconnectedness, and they see all that, the orbital perspective is what you do with that. So the orbital perspective is the call to action that comes from the overview effect, right? And so I, th I think, you know, I, you know I, I have no idea what the numbers are, what the percentages are, but there's going to be a percentage of people who are going to be profoundly changed, even if they go up on a four minute, you know, four minute weightless experience suborbital, they're going to be changed forever. Uh, they're going to have, they're going to come back and be much more inclined to be an environmentalist and all these other things. <clears throat> there's going to be other people that are, that are going to feel like they haven't been affected at all. They're going to have a wonderful experience. Uh, but it's not going to be much more than a joyride, right? But there's people. There, we're surrounded by miracles and on wonder every moment of every day, and there's and we've learned to ignore all that too. So mm -hmm. it, I, I think, there's no need to go to space. Um, I think it helps a lot because from space we look absolutely ridiculous, and and if you're inclined to see it, you're going to see how ridiculous we look. But you don't have to go to space to know how ridiculous we act here on, on the surface of the planet. And so it is an answer. It's not the answer. Uh, there are many answers. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm sure people flying in airplanes, even though a few thousand feet above the ground in you know, the 1920s had a atmospheric effect yeah. uh, or something like that and came back and told amazing stories of, you know, flying around a cloud and seeing tiny little ants that were you know, people and cities that, uh, that were toys. Um, and, and it did have an effect, but now people, you know, I can't tell you how many people I see get on an airliner and the first thing they do is, is close the window shade. Or, or um, take out their phones. Their, that's right. And then they're closing <clears throat> their thumbs. And, uh, you know, even, even though I, I have flown a lot and I've flown in space, I get on the airplane and I pick a window seat and I spend most of the time looking out the window because it is, as Ron says, there's wonder and awe around us all the time. Yeah. And uh, I think, you know, that's really, it, go, it goes back to, you know, what Ron said earlier, it's about education. I think as, as we can increase people's knowledge of, you know, how the world works and, you know, how our atmosphere works and how what we do affects that, but also, you know, the really cool things um, you know, biodiversity, you know, there's great stories that one can tell about life on earth uh, so that you can understand when you hear, you know, that, you know, 30% of songbirds, you know, are, are disappearing, that that's a big deal and that we're, we're losing something, you know, really uh, precious uh, when that happens. And so the, you know, the education piece, you know, folks often say, you know, why, why did I study physics? You know, why, why astrophysics, but why physics? And it's because now, now that I have a, a deep understanding of how things work, how our natural world works, for me, that allows me to experience much greater beauty uh, in nature than somebody who looks at something and they see colors and, you know, a different perspective. And, and maybe they appreciate it more than I do. Um, but I have a, you know, scientists have a different perspective that I think increases our appreciation uh, of, of certain kind of things. And, and that if more of us could share that, um, you know, and I'm sure, you know, you know, Ron, Ron was a fighter pilot and got to fly in an aircraft, you know, with an amazing view and see things, you know, and, and, and be able to fly through the air effort, atmosphere, effortless, nearly effortlessly. I'm not saying it was easy, um, 
but you know, using technology to do things that most people don't get to do. And you know, I find when I go flying, you know, it, it's I'm still amazed yeah. uh, at the things that I see. Yeah. Well, I can tell you that your comment about window seat blew up the chat. Suzanne calls it uh, uh, window team window seat there. And unfortunately, we're out of time, probably over time. But I agree. I'm one of those that sits in the window seat. Awe and wonder, as Ron says, it, it comes in many ways. And some of us look for it and, and others don't notice it. So it's up to those of us, including those who appreciate the night sky, to uh, point it out to other people who, who yep. are, have just think, spending too much time on the phone. We don't want to shut the window on the night sky. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And Kelly, are you coming back in here to uh, to wrap things up? Who comes in? After? Yeah, I, I am. And, and I should point out on this window seat thing that uh, the late uh, science writer for the New York Times, Walter Sullivan, wrote a book about he crisscrossed the country for decades on assignment. And he wrote a book about the landscape uh, below. I can't remember the name of the book, but uh, Walter Sullivan was the author. So uh, um, to John's point, Frank White got the idea of the overview effect on an airplane and sitting in the window seat, hmm. looking, looking down from the, from the window seat. Right on. So um, I, I think that this has been just phenomenal. Uh, the chat has been just going bananas uh, <laughs> with all the comments that have been happening on the side. And for those of you who asked questions, I'm sorry that we didn't get a chance. Uh, we were just kind of going with the flow here. And, and uh, Ron and, and John have been so articulate and evocative. A lot of us have never heard this before and have given us a new perspective. So um, it, I, I want to thank all three of you for having this just vibrant session that to conclude this this conference. And, um, uh, you know, we, <laughs> we're probably going to have to have you back to, to have round two on this. <laughs> um, I, I do have a few things to, to uh, just to say to uh, wrap up. Um, uh, first of all, I Again, thank you to all of you who have come this far. Betty Mai, I think we have a few slides to show here and feel free to start showing those. Um, you know, we, this has been a remarkable second global conference for the IDA. It is the, uh, a fabulous stepping stone to even better things. Uh, and so I, you know, first of all, thank you for joining us. I'm sure all of you are asking, well, how can I, how can I watch this again? How can I tell people about it? It will be posted on the, on the IDA's uh, website, conference.darksky.org will be the place. It's parts of it are already available on Facebook. It'll be available on YouTube as well. Uh, obviously we have hours and hours and hours of material here that we have to sort of uh, sort through and, and uh, get ready for posting. So we'll be doing that soon. But conference.darksky.org is the, the, the first place. And then so uh, another question I'm sure a lot of you have is, what can I do next? I'm inspired. What can I do? The first thing I would suggest is, as you see here, is to join the Dark Sky Advocate Network, which is run by Betamaya, and it meets uh, monthly. The next one is a training session on December 14th. Uh, these are fabulous ways for those of you, you know, I think one of the things that we have all discovered here is that um, uh, many of you didn't realize there was this, perhaps that there was this broad community, you're on your own in, in some uh, rural location or, or uh, uh, apart from uh, others of, of like mind. And this advocate network is a great way to connect with uh, a kind of a social network of Dark Sky Advocates. So I, Betty Mai has done great things with it and I highly recommend that you join that. Uh, another thing you can do is of course, to join the IDA itself. Uh, that is um, uh, something that I encourage all of you who are still here, all nearly 200 of you. Um, you know that there are, IDA has such influence in this particular arena of, of dark sky advocacy and working with local, state, federal, and international governments. Many of you are, are participants in that. Can you believe that there are only eight employees of IDA? That's what our, our membership, our funding allows for. There are so many other things we could be doing if we only had the staff to pursue them. So your dollars contributed either as donations or as to become IDA members are very valuable in advancing this 
important work that, that you are seeing uh, here. And of course, you can sign up to get emails. Uh, and, and, and so an important question I think is, what can you do? What's next? What, what, what can you do to, to advance this cause? And I call your attention to the next International Dark Sky Week. Uh, this was uh, something that was begun by a high school student roughly uh, 20 years ago now and has become really a global phenomenon. You have roughly five months to prepare. So I think you should challenge yourselves in your localities, wherever you are around the world, to do something substantial for International Dark Sky Week. Maybe it's taking a group of, of uh, school children out to a truly dark sky site, or adults for that matter, or policymakers to have them experience that dark sky. I think one of the takeaways from this session with uh, Colonel Guerin and Dr. Grunsfeld has been uh, that they are uni almost uniquely qualified to, to talk about the, the, the uh, perspective of, of seeing a truly dark night sky. I think if more people had that experience to see what we have lost, uh, I think that that uh, the, our our message would get through to a great many more people. So so mark that on your calendars. International Dark Sky Week. And also, um, we have uh, <laughs> we have opportunities uh, to um, to expand what we've done here. So those of you who are participating have participated. Uh, all the hundreds of you, you can expect to receive a survey in the mail. Uh, in the email that will give you uh, a, an opportunity to give us feedback on how to do a better conference next year and also the kinds of innovations and uh, projects that we might be in the, we the IDA might be in the position to undertake. And of course, uh, you can buy a t-shirt too. Uh, those that you know the merchandise sales that we have uh, help help support in many, many little ways. Um, I you know, I want to get back to this idea that there are only eight employees of the IDA and they have put together this masterful palette of so many different experiences, uh, inspirational experiences, uh, heart-wrenching experiences from around the world. And so if you feel like I do that this is a fight worth fighting, then do your part to, to uh, bring back the night sky in all its splendor and all of the other things that will come from that, the environmental good, the reduction in energy and so forth. And, um, and so until we meet again, and I hope that is soon, if not soon, then this time next year, I want to thank you all for attending this global conference, Under One Sky, the 2021 edition. I'm Kelly Beatty for the IDA, wishing you all a great rest of the year and a fantastic 2022. Thank you for joining us.